We're going to get started. Thanks for coming to the session. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, this presentation, and in fact, all the presentations will be recorded and made available on YouTube in a week or so. So if you want a copy of this, uh, there'll be one forthcoming. And another thing I wanted to point out, you are in a session for choosing the right data storage solutions in AWS. It's a 200 level session, so there'll be some acronyms and terminology that I may not explain, so I apologize if, if there's something that you don't understand. Uh, myself and some of my colleagues will be here after the session, so if you have any questions, I think we're going to go right to the end of the time on the presentation, so we'll stick around and answer questions that you, you might have. Uh, my name is Joe Lyons. I manage a global storage business development team, and we are aligned to storage within AWS. And my domain would include S3 and Glacier. Uh, it would also include EBS. Uh, Direct Connect, and the AWS Storage Gateway. However, given the fact that there are managed services like RDS and DynamoDB that have storage options with you, I'm going to cover lightly some of those as well. So uh, what we'll cover today, we're going to start with object storage, S3. We'll move on to block storage option. Then we're going to talk a little bit about sync volumes, which will also include backup and DR use cases. Then we'll get into the relational database and NoSQL database. And then I think the most interesting part, and it always is, is uh, our customer presentation. So we have uh, Esri here, uh, which has a solution called ArcGIS that runs in AWS. Great solution, some really good stories there. So I think that presentation will kind of pull it all together. Esri's a great example because they're someone that's been with us for a while. They use a lot of the storage services. And they recently actually just started using uh, SaaS model to go down market to make uh, their software available to folks that in the past haven't been able to afford it. So I think that'll be fun. Okay, in terms of growth, obviously everyone in here on your laptops, on your cell phones, as consumers, we're constantly producing more data and it's staggering. In S3, I have one customer in particular that grows over a petabyte per day sustained. So we're seeing a lot of growth in S3, but it's not just the consumer that's driving this growth, it's the enterprise as well. Uh, we have customers like Shell that have sensors all the way down to the bottom of the drill bit that, that send up massive amounts of data that need to be kept for perpetuity. Um, so very difficult to, to manage that when the data can not only never be deleted or purged, but also it needs to be accessible. And there are some challenges there in different types of media and different types of storage solutions in terms of restore. So let's start off with object storage. Um, our solution is called S3. And for those of you who don't know, that means simple storage service, very easy to use, puts, gets, copies, deletes, very, very simple to use, and scales as well. Now, in terms of durability, which is very, very important, I spent a lot of time in the media sector and the finance sector over the years, and you would think banks would be maniacal about data retention and durability, but um, they're not as, as bad as the media guys, right? They really want to keep those assets and they want to restore those assets. And we have other educational institutions and foundations that want to save data for posterity for, forever. And so you need durability. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on on how we achieve that durability. Um, so we're durable, probably the most durable storage subsystem in the world. We can withstand up to two data center losses within a region, and I'll explain regions later, uh, without losing any data for our customers. But we're also very, very large. So earlier this year, we passed over one trillion unique customer objects in AWS. And in terms of transactions, we handle a massive amount of transactions, over 750,000 transactions per second in S S3. And a transaction would be a put, a get, et cetera. So within S3, you have this concept of buckets. You create buckets. There are limitations on the buckets. You have a uh, 100 bucket limit. And then in those buckets, you put your objects or your files. Did we lose uh, the presentation? Sorry, folks. Why he's doing that, I'll explain a little bit about how we achieve durability in S3. So we have this concept of regions. We have about nine regions now that we opened up Australia last week around the globe. And within those regions, we have this concept of availability zones. And that's really our fancy term for a data center. Right? So regions are made up of multiple availability zones. And you, as a customer, make some choices when you decide to provision assets in S3. Or, sorry, in all of AWS, in fact. Um, choice number one, you're going to choose your region or regions. Um, choice number two, 
you're going to choose the availability zone that you want to build those assets in. Perhaps you're going to provision some EC2 and some EBS, et cetera. And then choice number three, you might decide to load balance between two availability zones so that you have a, an HA configuration. So with S3, our customers don't need to make that choice, right? Once you upload objects into whatever availability zone or whatever region you've chosen, for lack of a better way to describe it, multiple copies of that object will be made within the availability zone and will be copied across all availability zones within the region. So it's important to note, fantastic. Thank you. I'll try not to bump into that. Yeah, I'll just stay, stay back. So uh, multiple copies made throughout the AZs and across all AZs. The data does not leave the region. You as a customer would have to actually choose to move the data into another region. So if for any reason you needed to make sure the data stays in the US or stays in Singapore, et cetera, stays on shore in Australia, um, that, that will be natively available. Perfect example in terms of our growth in S3 is a uh, client called Spotify. And Spotify offers on-demand MP3 music. So unlike something like Pandora, which you just choose a genre, if you will, and you listen to music, you can actually uh, pick an actual song and play it on Spotify. And they upload over 20,000 tracks a day into S3. Now in terms of your website, if you do have static content, there is something called S3 website, very economical way to, to create a website using S3. Again, this is for static content, not dynamic content. And we're inexpensive. Now, I have to say, this is out of date as of Andy Jassy's announcement this morning. So we were, we've done 26 price reductions uh, over the years. And today was number 27. So we reduced S3 prices uh, quite considerably. So if you check out our website, you'll see both for S3 standard and for RRS, the price has gone down quite a bit, about 24 to 26% reduction in prices for S3. Now, keep in mind, the prices will vary by region. Right, so we want to make sure we're offering the lowest cost possible to our customers. So each region has different costs, especially when it comes to network in certain regions. So the cost will vary slightly from region to region. So this is an example of US standard, what the prices were. And then when you look at reduced redundancy storage, you're going to see that that went down about 20% lower than what the new S3 price is. Um, so check that out. The other thing you can do with S3 as your origin is use CloudFront to deliver that content. So if you have files that you know, a small amount of files that need to be delivered to many, many, many people. So we have customers that have a new software upgrade to be downloaded or uh, a popular game or popular video, things like that. Content delivery is a great way uh, to save a lot of money. And we'll, we'll actually see trends when we look at our trends week over week. And I'll see a customer with maybe $1,000 in S3 spend. And I'll take a look at their transfer out bill. And transfer out is when data leaves AWS and goes off someplace else in the internet. That's a transfer. And that's a transfer fee for that, a network charge. So I'll see a customer with 20,000 a month in transfer fees and 1,000 a month in S3 storage, and we get on the phone with that customer right away and say, hey, you should be using CloudFront. You can save thousands and thousands by using CloudFront edges to deliver from cash down to whoever's downloading that solution. And in that example, not only will that customer save thousands and thousands of dollars per month, their customer experience will be much, much better. So it downloads much better that way. Let's talk about Oracle's secure backup module. Uh, for our enterprise customers or Oracle users, Oracle's been a partner of Amazon's for quite some time now. You can run pretty much anything on Amazon with the exception of Rack. Uh, but Oracle has a backup module called RMAN um, and an another option called DataGuard. So in the case of RMAN, it's very, very simple. Most customers are using R uh, porting Oracle to an expensive backup software program, or they're pointing it to RMAN, and that points to tape. Maybe that goes off-site over time. So what you can do when you, when you can just go into Oracle RMA and just redirect it and point it right at S3. No, no need to do anything else. And there are a lot of benefits to this. In fact, the great use case is Amazon.com. We have a white paper that's available on our Oracle AWS website that you can download and learn all about how .com eliminated, eliminated tape entirely in their environment. In fact, at the time the white paper was published, about a month or two ago, they were down about 85% of their environment was tapeless and they expect to be 100% tapeless by December. So why do they do that? Um, obviously tape, they had a lot of drive contention. It was taking uh, backup administrators uh, you know, a lot of time to do restores because there was a lot of drive contention. Um, software to manage it was expensive. So they looked at the solution. The white paper will, will outline the five kind of core tenants they looked at. They looked at security, looked at accessibility, scalability, cost obviously is a big one. They saved about a million dollars a year most of that cost takeout came from eliminating expensive backup software. It was very, very seamless uh, in integration. 
And one of the big things that they came out was kind of a soft benefit, but they spent a lot of time doing capacity planning throughout the year. Database administrators coming up just needing another half, you know, a terabyte or another terabyte. And it was very difficult for them to pr predict. So this eased a lot of that burden. So it's a great white paper. I encourage you to check it out, and it's very easy to try as well. You know, most of our customers that have scaled on AWS kind of dip their toes in the water first, right? Tried using solutions like this, very low risk, very easy to implement. So when do you use S3? You use S3 when you, have, when you need unlimited storage capacity. We talked a little bit about that. When you need high durability, um, it's great for backups, eliminate tape. And as a single origin store with delivery to CloudFront, fantastic solution. Great way to save money. Speaking of saving money, we spent a lot of time over the past year talking to customers about the choices that they have in AWS. Uh, earlier, I showed a slide that showed RRS being less expensive to S3. And I, I didn't explain why that was, so I'll do that now. Um, what we did, we had customers come to us and say, we love the durability of S3, we like the pricing, but what we really like is a little less expensive tier, and I don't need that kind of durability. I can settle with four nines of durability, which would be very similar to, you know, RAID 5 comp configured array replicated asynchronously to a second site type of config for RRS. And so we, we launched RRS, and all we're doing with RRS is keeping fewer copies of your data in fewer availability zones. But it's still replicated across at least two availability zones. But Amazon Glacier was a different requirement for customers. They came to us and they said, look, we like S3, RRS was a good step in the right direction, but what I really need is a very low cost archival tier, and I'm not willing to trade off durability, but I am willing to trade off on cost. And so we launched Glacier, and Glacier is now a penny per gig per month for Glacier, and to put that into perspective, $120 a terabyte year. So extremely disruptive technology in launching Glacier. And this gave them that archive tier that you, that you need. And when you think about Glacier, you really want to do think about long-term archives. Um, again, we'll show the durability. You want to think about long-term archives, and you want to think about retrieval time. So that was a trade-off. We decided, okay, we're going to give you very low cost, penny per gig, but retrieval is going to take a little time because we're going to optimize in the back end so that we can save money and pass those savings on to the customer. So you want to expect a three to five hour retrieval time to retrieve data from Glacier to you to, for use in however you want to, want to use that data. So you want to think about that. Also, when you're looking at retrievals and you take a look at Glacier pricing, there's, a, there's two aspects to the pricing like there is with most storage services. One is the cost of the storage, very simple, penny per gig. The other is going to be the retrieval costs. Right? If you're retrieving over 5% of your archive, there's going to be a higher retrieval cost for that retrieval. So you want to think about how much data you're, you're pulling back. And, and when we look at the market at large, we see that most customers retrieve about 2% of their archive in a given month. So we get, we give, we're a little more generous than that. Um, the other thing that we noticed when we talked about requirements for Glacier, we had customers tell us, if I had a tier like that, I would, you know, three to five hours is okay. Some customers said, actually, I could, uh, you know, four days is fine for me because it's on tape off site right now. And if I need something back from archive, I got to, you know, call Iron Mountain. I got to bring, you know, tapes back. I got to load them. So that takes me four or five days. So that's fine. So what we did was put the control in the customer's hand. Rather than lock you into three to five hours with a cost over 5%, you can actually stretch the retrieval out over time and save tre tremendous amounts of money on those retrievals. But again, uh, the, the retrieval time was also designed to drive the right behavior. Right? This really should be used as an archive and not an, an, an active repository for your, for your content. Great for backup. Great for tape elimination. That's where we're seeing a lot of activities eliminating tape with, with Glacier. And, and the reason we're seeing that is for the first time, your archive is sitting next to the world's biggest supercomputer. You can actually do something. Typically, archives are dusty, offsite. I hope I never need it. And when I bring it back, I hope it's intact. So now we, we actually have um, the ability to, uh, to, to keep that archive close to compute. So you want to use Amazon Glacier when you need inexpensive long-term archiving. You want to use it when you need unlimited storage capacity, like S3, unlimited. Um, eliminating tape, a concept called tape museums. C customers who want to save a 50 or 100-year archive either have to keep a tape museum uh, and have all sorts of old uh, infrastructure and architecture to, to be able to restore if they do ever need an asset that's sitting, that had been sitting in storage for 20, 30 years. Eliminating tech refresh, which is huge. I mean, imagine your organization needed something 90 years later. You, haven't, you literally have not touched that asset for 90 years, and you know it's going to be intact, and it's easy to restore. Um, and of course, when you need high durability, right? Archives need to be highly durable. Now we have S3 Glacier. So when we first launched Glacier, there was no integration layer with any other service. Glacier was a standalone product. Now that we have S3 Glacier, there's a tight integration between the two services. 
And we've also enabled policy-based management or hierarchical storage management, HSM, with Glacier by using this, this concept of policy-based APIs. So to give you an example of what we can do now with Glacier is you could do a put into S3 and you apply a policy. In this example, the policy is 30 days. Right? After 30 days, that object will automatically expire into Glacier. In this example, 365 days later, it would then expire altogether and be deleted. So if you have policies on, on how long you, you retain data, different retention policies, one year, three year, five year, seven year, one of the things about the cloud is it's just going to keep growing. People just tend to use it and it keep, continues to grow. So many of our customers came to us with a little bit of friction saying, I, I really am having a hard time going back and deleting my objects. They just keep growing and growing and growing. So we implemented um, object expiration and now these hierarchical policy management. So we're really creating a seamless HSM experience in the cloud, managing your data sets in the right tier for what you need when you need it. Um, example of HSM for enterprises, right? On the bottom, we have the traditional approach, right? Many customers introduced tiered storage. Um, some customers then introduced HSM. The difference would be with tiered storage, you have, you know, this application is sitting on this storage versus this application is on that storage. That's tiering. If you're doing HSM, as the data ages or becomes less important to the business, it's automatically going to the next tier. But the eventual home for that data was on tape. And again, we talked about tape museums. If you do need something, if you haven't every five to eight years gone into your tape archive, brought everything back, put it all into your library, restore everything, and then back it up on the latest technology and put it back in archive, which, by the way, if you see a price tag for that, you'll have sticker shock. It's very expensive to do if you have massive amounts of off-site tape archives. We have many enterprises with hundreds of thousands of off-site tapes, so a very big pain point. And so customers need to make a decision. Do I just firewall that off, let that problem burn itself out, and start doing the new thing? With Glacier, I do a restore once and for all, and then restore everything in Glacier. So we're really changing the way they do business. They also include re regulated industries, because many industries that are regulated you know, must require, you know, are required to keep data for an uh, extensive amount of time. In, in, in FDA, for instance, they have to have the whole OS image of a drug that was developed, and it can never be deleted. So Glacier's a great uh, uh, solution for that. And same problem exists for, for, that, for that marketplace in terms of, of restores, but a lot of regulation around them, a lot of penalties around them if, if uh, drug research is being done or, or something needs to be you know, audited. If they don't have that data, it'll stiff, stiff penalties uh, for those industries. So again, Glacier makes a, a, a great fit for that, that space. So use S3 Glacier when you want to HSM in the cloud. You can use Glacier, again, by itself or be very, very interactive with S3. And archive data from S3 or RRS to Glacier by policy, and then delete data from Glacier again by policy, and that's a choice that you make over time. And it's important to note when you do a restore from Glacier, um, you do that operation, we're not actually going to take the file out of Glacier and put it into S3. What we're going to do is gonna, we're going to copy that file and put it into RRS, which is much less expensive. There, then you can go ahead and do whatever it is you need to do with the data, and you can also set a policy on that object that you moved into RRS or copied into RRS and say put a policy on it for five days and five days later the object will delete so you don't forget and then have all these costs that you find at the end of the month uh, for those objects that you decided to pull in and restore from archive. So let's move on to block storage. Um, when provisioning within EC2 you can always use the ephemeral storage that's within the server and we have many customers that, that use that and the amount of storage that you have there is going to vary by the instance size. When you're using ephemeral storage, uh, it's important to note that when you turn your instance down, which is one of the benefits of EC2, spin up, spin down, your storage goes away. So if you need your storage to be persistent, when you turn down your EC2 instances, you want to use Amazon EBS or Elastic Block Storage. So we can create up to one terabyte drives, and you can stripe those drives together to create uh, larger and larger footprints. And you can also use what's called provisioned IOPS. So EBS is great for, for spiky workloads, but in terms of uh, workloads that need consistent IOPS, we've now provisioned uh, PyOPS on EBS, and you can actually create a consistent experience for your block storage with EC2. So here's a picture of an EC2 instance. And the way I look at EBS, the way it's different from S3, is customers can use S3 by itself they don't have to use any other service on, on AWS. Whereas EBS, the only way to use EBS is through an EC2 instance. All right, so here's an example. Now, what you'd want to do, push that one. What you want to do is, uh, here's an example of uh, an instance going down. 
Okay, so your instance failed, no problem. You bring up a, another EC2 instance and then reattach it to the EBS volume and all your data is there and your application's back up and running. So very simple way to configure. Also, again, I mentioned this earlier, you, you can stripe multiple EBS volumes together and if, if your application needs more, more storage. The other thing to keep in mind is now that you're running EBS, uh, you've got data sitting in EBS, you're going to want to create snapshots for that data. And the best way to do that is to put those snapshots in the world's most durable storage subsystem being S3. So customers can set that up as a schedule, you can set that up as manual. So a great way to protect your data is using snapshots. I highly recommend doing that. So use Amazon EBS when you want to create a uh, virtual file system, for instance. Uh, Long-term persistent storage for your EC2 instances, great use case for EBS. Uh, if your data changes frequently, it's a great place for you, e, uh, EBS. And access to raw, unformatted block-level storage. Let's go into sync volumes, what we mean by that. Early this year, we released the AWS Storage Gateway. And this was the first time AWS crawled inside the data center for the customer because it's a software download. You download the software from our website, and you spin that up on a VM instance, and you point your applications to the gateway, and then it'll do a couple things for you. Uh, on the one hand, there's a DR version. The DR, or backup version of the gateway, is going to keep one copy of the data locally on that local storage of everything. And it'll do a second copy in the form of an EBS snapshot into, EC, uh, into S3 in the cloud. So the reason I mentioned that it's, it's up there as an EBS snapshot in S3 is that there are many gateways in the marketplace today, and there are many backup software, uh, enterprise backup software solutions on the market today that are compatible with S3. But they're doing some proprietary things to your data, cool stuff, right? They're doing compression, deduplication, encryption, and they're putting it up into S3. The issue is there that you don't have the opportunity to, to use all the other assets in AWS, right? If you want to normalize that data, it's got to come back down the wire and back through that third-party gateway, normalized, and then you can use it. Unless you, have, you spend a little extra money and that gateway actually has an AMI version or a software version, you could run a second gateway in EC2, normalize the data there, and then use it in, in AWS. But a level of complexity, complexity adds a level of cost. Um, so the, the, the AWS Storage Gateway is a great solution if you ever want to actually use the data again once it's been backed up into S3. The other version of this gateway is called Cache Volumes. So what Cache Volumes will do you download that, you spin that up, you point your applications to it, and then you set a policy. And that policy is going to be frequently accessed data stays local, and then everything else goes into S3, which is great because you can thin provision your assets on-prem. And when you do that, you can either extend the life of the assets that you have today, so maybe you expected to reach capacity in six months, now you won't reach capacity for a year in six months because frequently accessed data tends to be, for many applications, 15 or 20% of the data set. So if you have applications like that, it's a great use case here. Now you're really creating some cost savings opportunities for yourself because you think about the workflow with cache volumes, you ha now have thin provisioning on-prem. So I've either reduced the assets that I need to own or I extended the life of those assets, which is great. Cost savings there one way or the other. I've got the data in S3, so if someone, let's say my policy was three days on-prem, 60 days in S3, and then delete or move into Glacier, in that 60 days it's in S3, if a user needed the asset, and you can withstand a few hundred millisecond delay, it's going to be a great user experience. They won't even know. They'll be completely obscured that their data is, some of it's here, some of it's in S3. It'll look as if it's all in, in one place. So it's a great solution for, uh, for thin provisioning. Um, in terms of uh, Glimpse, one of our big customers, they implemented and their restore time went from days to hours. So it was a great backup solution for them, eliminated tape, sped, speed, speeding up the backups. Very similar story that we talked about with the R R man gateway, so I won't go into too much detail about that use case. So when do you use the gateway? You want to use that when you need to backup your data or synchronize your data, when you need to export data for migration, uh, thin provisioning your SAN, or you can actually use it for departmental file shares. So we had a lot of customers came to us and say, okay, the gateway is not going, the, 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 the cache ver volumes version of the gateway is not going to replace my EMC or my NetApp, but I do have applications or departments running on the, those expensive file shares, and I'd love to get the data off there. And I get small requests for small little additional changes. You can actually stand up the gateway, put a file server in front of it, and create a file share for certain departments, and then just set and forget and let those departments do what they need to do. Now, we talked about getting your data in the cloud, but we also have a solution called VM Import. Right? With VM Import, we want to get your images into the cloud. So you can routinely 
by, by schedule, move your VM images into EC2, and then, or into S3, I should say, and then if your application fails, you can either bring that back down or you can actually move, recreate your environment in AWS, especially if you have a pre-built uh, AMI. So it's a great solution to get your image up there as well. Many customers use this when they want to do AWS for disaster recovery. So they have an on-prem solution uh, where they're running everything, and then they have an event. They, they actually, that application comes back up and running in AWS. They point their users to AWS, and then everything's back and running. And, and depending on how you configure that, the RTO and RPO might, might vary. Uh, the reason this is great is that when this is your DR solution, uh, you don't have to worry about how long you run in DR mode. Right? DR sites are expensive, and you, you're paying for assets that you're hopefully not using ever, with the exception of maybe a test here or there. Uh, in this case, and also they're oversubscribed. Let's not forget that. Um, you can't run in DR mode forever because you don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one DR site. You might go, okay, I'm gonna, I'll be oversubscribed. I just hope you know we don't have massive failures and and I can get back up and running in time before I run out of uh, assets in my DR site. And if you're using a managed service provider for DR, MSPs are just like uh, if you, any of you go to a gym or have a gym membership, the gym might be only be able to fit 300 people in the gym, but they can sell 1,500 memberships, right? They, they're unlimited because they, they know people either won't come or they won't call, come all at once at least. Same thing is uh, applied to uh, managed service providers for DR. Way oversubscribed. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, relational databases. Um, you can build your own database in AWS. Right? We have many customers that make the mistake when they're comparing the cost of running their own database, and then they look at uh, RDS, which is a, the service I'm about to explain, and they compare those two costs, and that's an unfair comparison because uh, running your own database, if that's something you like to do, you have the resources to do it, you can actually move your licenses with license mobility, move them over, spin up the licenses in EC2, attach EBS volumes, and manage your own database. It's efficient, it's fast because you're the developer, you can tune that to meet your needs, so it, it's actually good performance, but you are managing it yourself. But you have to manage backups, scaling, updates, monitoring, replication, and you know, these are things that you know, take up your nights or weekends from time to time. So a while back we in introduced a managed service called RDS, which is a rela relational database service, and what we've done is we've you know, put a package around all these, the, these options that you have, Oracle, MySQL, and SQL Server, and, and created a managed service. So it's very simple to go to launch a database instance. You just go launch database instance. Um, you select your engine, your version, passwords, all those sorts of controls, et cetera, and you go from this to this, fully managed. So it's a great solution. And you also have vertical scaling, right? So if you need to scale up your relational database fast, you can scale up, but more importantly, you can scale back down. So if you have spiky workloads at the end of the month, end of the year, seasonally, something goes viral that you weren't aware of, you know, you can, we can meet your demands there. But just because you're using RDS doesn't mean you have to, you know, don't have to think about backups and snapshots, you still want to protect your data. So you can have a user DBS triggered snapshot, well, there's one of the terms I'm not going to explain, snapshot. <laughs> Very technical, I won't get into it, right? But you can uh, create snapshots uh, using the R RDS storage snapshots, so a little bit of different. And then scale your instance, you'll just connect your snapshots and just continue to scale, scale, scale up the instance and still have the data protected in the snapshots and pull back over. Um, and read replicas, too. You know, what you can do, obviously, if you've got a web tier expansion, it's creating more work for the database, you can move read traffic to their own instances for the time being. If that's just a temporary phenomenon that's happening, move that over, handle reads over here, uh, give the master more, more uh, capacity uh, to manage. So it's great for high read uh, workloads. Um, but make sure you shut them down when you're done. So if you're gonna do read replica instances and the, the event or the time of year, season or event, whatever is over, make sure you turn those down because you are gonna be paying for those. Um, okay, so additional redundancy, right? We talked about how with S3 we're taking care of that for you, but you as a customer need to make uh, those choices for yourselves with services like RDS. So we have multi-AZ. You can have standby synchronous replica data into a second availability zone but it's extreme, uh, failover is very hard to do in a normal instance. It's, it's uh, very hard to do, you just check this box that says multi-AZ and you're done and the data is gonna be replicated to a second site and you'll be protected, so just check the box. So when do you use RDS? When we uh, use relational database engines that are supported on us, uh, peace of mind about your data and your ability to grow, scale up and scale down and if you wanna get some time back, it's a great solution. Let's move on to NoSQL. 
So traditional, traditionally, when you're scaling NoSQL databases, you get to a certain point where you need per, per, consistent performance, but performance starts to drop uh, organically, so you have to, have to start using complex methods like sharding or uh, memory cache, et cetera, to kind of increase performance. And the scalability challenge with these databases is as the requirement is I need this consistent storage, but in reality, performance degrades with scale, and this is when we start using these methods to try and improve that. Not easy to manage. So we introduced DynamoDB, high performance, fully managed NoSQL database, and very low latency. Average reads are five milliseconds, and that's about uh, the time it takes for a neuron to charge in your brain. So it's very, very fast. And seamless scalability, no table size or throughput limits, no changes, downtime, no repartitioning. So it's a fantastic service and also maintained as you scale. So we're gonna take care of all those things in the background. We're gonna make sure that your performance is maintained and predictable regardless of how far you're scaling. Um, in DynamoDB, in terms of being durable and available, consistent disk-only writes using solid-state disk. Most importantly, zero administration. So I encourage you to check that out. So here, uh, in introducing DynamoDB, we go to this legacy architecture managed by yourself and we transform it into simple scale with DynamoDB. Actually, I've got some colleagues in the audience today that actually work exclusively with databases, so following the session, as I said, if there are questions on RDS or DynamoDB, um, they'll be available to answer your questions. Um, in terms of a uh, great use case for, for DynamoDB, uh, we had uh, Shazam wanted to do a special in the Super Bowl, and they wanted every user at the Super Bowl to be able to hold up their Shazam, or, and every user watching, the millions and millions of people watching at home, in Shazam, a song that they were gonna play for a contest. Um, oh, by the way, they wanted to do this. They came to us three days or two days before the Super Bowl. They're like, we wanna do this, right? We're like, wow, it's gonna be massive scale with all the millions and millions of people watching this thing. And this is what they, they needed, 500,000 rights per second sustained during the Super Bowl. So it was a great, great use case. And again, took advantage of a massive audience late, late, late in the game. Would never have been able to do that with on-prem storage. And then scaled up, took care of the event, wildly successful, really got a lot of brand awareness out there for them, and then turned everything off, most importantly. So when do we use DynamoDB? When you need, again, extremely low latency, read-write operations, scalability and durability, when you need predictable performance, and most importantly, zero maintenance, and scale up, scale down. So let's review. We covered object storage, we covered block storage, sync volumes, relational databases, and NoSQL databases. And then I think this is where we get to the fun part, right? You have a lot of choices. Right? You've got to make the right choices for the right solutions. And you can talk to us, right? We have uh, a fleet of sales and business development folks here and throughout the world, that, and that's our job, right? Talk to customers. We have a whole fleet of solution architects. And that's what we do. We help our customers create the right architectures, make sure that they're configuring things correctly. I had one customer tell me that the cloud is kind of like running with scissors, right? It can be a lot of fun, but it can be a little dangerous. So you want to make sure you're working with us if you have any questions, and, and we'll, we'll help you uh, correctly architect that. But with that, I want to, more importantly, have our customer talk to us. I'm going to introduce Mara from, from Esri, who's going to tell you a little bit about Esri. Thanks, you bet. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, who Esri is. A lot of people haven't heard about Esri even though it's been around for a while. Uh, Esri is uh, the world uh, leader in geographic information systems. Uh, around 2011, revenue was about uh, $1 billion. We operate in over 100 countries. There's almost a representation for Esri in every country around the world. Uh, got thousands and thousands of customers around the world uh, using our software in all sorts of different languages and all sorts of different purposes, working in different industries. And our headquarters is in Redlands, California. Esri helps organizations uh, with multiple of things. I've just listed here a couple of examples. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly because I want to get into the real examples I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Esri's offerings right now on Amazon Web Services um, or can be summarized as uh, an army that we provide with our software that our users can just launch and start using the software right away. Uh, also, Esri managed services where uh, we would help our users to set up their own um, applications and solutions and possibly do some extra hosting and development. So I want to start with an example. Um, 
Esri is really known for maps uh, and doing analysis around location and spatial information. And uh, one of the recent uh, events that took place uh, where Esri was uh, in a lot of um, news um, events and reports uh, was around Sandy. Uh, we usually respond to any natural event by having a specific team at Esri who will work to contribute to helping with this event management. Uh, and we had a team that got prepared for Sandy, started getting the feeds that NOAA was putting out, created maps, put some analysis that showed how Sandy's going to proceed. And we actually reached out to Amazon to see if they would contribute and help out with that uh, by uh, contributing with some of the resources. So uh, both Amazon and Esri collaborated to build this application that uh, became online. And an important part of managing an event like that is sharing information not just for the people that are going to be impacted by the event, but also for organizations that are working around that event. So it was very important to make sure this data is available and shared to a wide variety of users. And uh, little did we know, I mean, we kind of used about six to seven servers in Amazon putting this application like we usually do. And soon enough, uh, it was on CBS News in a lot of newspapers and, uh, you know, making sure we're not the victim of our own success, we were able to use uh, the resources that Amazon has to expand this quickly to a much bigger number of servers. And we kept adding servers to respond to the millions and millions of hits uh, that came during that time. Disaster management is data intensive and storage is a, cr uh, is a critical part of managing that kind of uh, application. Uh, for example, in the case of Sandy, we wanted to track what happened before and after. And a lot of the satellite imagery is requiring a lot of storage, requires high I.O. for the disk uh, in order to retrieve it and display it, especially if we're putting all of that behind a web application. In this case, we were leveraging EBS, and we had copies of historical data that we were leveraging, in addition to data that FEMA has started sharing regarding what is happening in the situation. And we have this application online now where our users and anybody can go and view what happened before and after and track that. Historical data is an area where you want to keep data along the years to see how areas are affected, not just in disasters, but also across growth and development. In this case also for uh, understanding the impact of Sandy, we use some of our tools which requires the processing capabilities to understand how to cross-reference what happened with uh, the demographic information that is available. And from there understand the impact, create maps that show the areas where there is more important areas that have been affected that would need urgent um, attention and help in those specific areas uh, by understanding the populations, the much, uh, how much damage has happened in those areas, and cross-analyzing all of that together to highlight these points where urgent attention is needed. So to us, AWS is an ecosystem. It's not just an area where we would operate in isolation. Uh, this is another good example for this. The data used here has been uh, Twitter data. We utilize that through a partner called GNIP, and they provide historical data for Twitter. So what we wanted to do was an analysis across a specific hotel chain, and we wanted to do something called cloud analysis on the Twitter data. And based on that, we would highlight on the map people who have more influence on others and how they influence their network of influence and how it spreads in a specific area. In order to get the GNIP data, which is very intensively uh, high volume, it would have been a major effort if we were doing this uh, through natural means where we would get the data from them and then start processing it. But because the data was in the Amazon cloud, we were able to copy it directly without actually even paying for that because we we're doing it over the same network. And the data became available in very short time. It was very easy to use in that case. So the fact that we're not just inside Amazon, but the fact that we have partners that operate inside Amazon gave us the ability to get the data quickly and operate together within that environment. Here's another example that shows, sorry, that shows uh, national analysis. In this case, the data was collected nationally across all of the US over a period of 30 days. 
This was a massive amount of data. And the analysis would have taken a very long time if we were doing it outside the cloud. Without the ability to move and use the storage capabilities and processing capabilities of the cloud, this analysis would have been very, very difficult. Now, I want to drill down a little bit into a case study. Uh, this is regarding tiled map services. Uh, you've probably all seen this online, those small map tiles that make maps as you zoom in and zoom out when you're viewing a map. These tiles usually require pre-creation, so we sometimes refer to it as cooking. And in order to do these type of operations, you don't need just uh, a lot of storage, but you also need a lot of CPU power. Typically, historically, people would create labs just for that. And then they would use their lab to create a certain map cache. They would schedule, this week we're going to cook this area, the following week we're going to do this area. And it would be something that usually is kind of prohibitive, uh, where they are restricted by the resources they get. Using the cloud, this kind of operation changed dramatically. Now, each project or each department would be able to get as many resources as they need when it's needed. And they would get as much storage as they need. And when they're done, they terminate it all and they've efficiently got what they needed faster than they usually do. So right now, uh, the systems that have been set up, uh, we have a production system where anybody can get our software using the AMIs that I referred to earlier. They can set it up with the storage. And the storage can come in two different types. It can be either imagery data set or it can be vector data set running behind the database. In this case, EBS has been the main storage area. The software in this case will take all of this data and create the tiled maps and put them still on EBS. But then we used S3 for publishing these map tiles. And by moving the tiles to S3, this would be a location where they are highly available and accessible. And we can keep growing the size of the tiles as needed. Uh, needless to say, they can grow very quickly, very fast, depending on how many scales are included. And as you kind of go deeper in the scales, they kind of get much, much bigger in size. So the tiles tend to grow very quickly in size. We also leverage the Amazon CloudFront. CloudFront made this uh, highly available, not just within one region, but across all of the regions. So if we published a base map that has global content, it can easily become available across the whole world with good performance. And of course, very quickly, after uh, such production systems were put in place, people started getting the idea, well, let's make this accessible automatically through a portal, where our users can just go to this portal and start creating these map caches and publishing them. So a portal was created where users can automatically go to that environment and start leveraging that. And we actually have a few portals around the world now that are kind of coming on service to enable users to do that themselves very quickly. So in this case, S3 has become this unlimited storage uh, location where many people can come to the portal, create these tiled maps, and publish them through S3. It's low maintenance, uh, high availability. We don't really have to do much except just copy the tiles there and it's taken care of. Also right now we're using a simple DB uh, as a location where we keep extra information about the system, how we operate certain things, uh, but we're planning very soon to start moving to DynamoDB to replace that. For extra references around Esri, uh, Esri.com is a place where you could get extensive information about what we do. Uh, there's also a white paper that's been recently published with Amazon. You'll find it under the Partners tab. And resources.esri.com is also a very good location to go and get more information about all these topics. Yeah, thank you. Is that, uh, we'll bring it back to Joe. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. It's great to see how software like that running on AWS can help in events of, uh, like Sandy, it affected so many people. Um, in terms of related content, um, check out some of these related uh, sessions for storage. A couple more today and a number tomorrow. Um, one that I'd like to point out is uh, Thursday, 1135, it says Cloud Storage War Stories from the front lines of some of the biggest battles. It's going to be a panel session. 
And some of our biggest customers that have spent a lot of time and, and learned a lot of best practices are going to share the good and the bad of, of, uh, of, of migrating to AWS, either in a, uh, holistically or in a hybrid model. Um, actually, the VP of IT for Amazon.com will also be there, and he'll be talking about that tape elimination project that I talked about with Armand and other use cases uh, for, for Amazon.com. In terms of web, web resources, everything we talked about here today, uh, lots and lots of resources uh, available on the web, uh, both on for S3, for Glacier, for digital media, et cetera. So I encourage you to go to the website and, of course, talk to the Amazonians that, uh, that, are, that are here. In terms of where to find me later, I'll be at the Executive Briefing Center um, post, which is on the second floor. Uh, so if someone wants to catch up with me and you can't do it after this session, feel free to, to, to find me down there. And with that, um, we're eager to hear your feedback so that we can improve. Most of AWS was built on customer feedback, and we want to we'll do this again next year. We want to make sure that, that we continue to improve. So any feedback is good for us, and we really appreciate you guys spending the time here today. Thank you.